All right, what's up everyone? This is Ryan here and you are watching episode 20 of my live stream for Android uh, developer Q&A and stuff like that. Uh, a couple things I do have to apologize. I'm bloody tired today. It was a super long week and uh, as a result of that long week, I'm basically done my rough draft for my first ebook, which is going to be an introductory ebook for uh, Android development. So it's basically going to take you from sort of what you need to know Java wise all the way to it's sort of like a roadmap and a bit of a guide and uh, it's not going to be like a huge technical manual but it's got lots of code samples lots of explanations if you like my videos I think you're probably going to like the book but that's all I'm going to say about it for now other than the fact that the rough draft is almost done so uh, before we continue I would just like to thank the following people for supporting me on Patreon I've got a couple new supporters so I'd like to thank Seth Keegan, Shan, Tina Fredericks, Tony Jones Jr., Trevor Helvorson, Basam Halal, Nanotech, Shadow, Mr. Bidwell, Sushil Chanda, and Dilad Stavi. All these people are freaking amazing and I uh, really appreciate your support. And if you like what I do, please do consider uh, sending me a fiver or something like that on Patreon. I do appreciate it and it will go to good use. So. I don't actually have any announcements for today other than the ebook thing, and I don't really have any plans for today because it's episode 20, and every 10th episode, what I like to do is just give my brain a rest, and that's pretty good because this week my brain's just not really... Um, I've been spending just so much time writing on the basics of Android and dealing with work that I'm probably not... wouldn't have even been very good at answering the more technical questions today anyway. But on the non-technical Q&A episode, uh, you can feel free to ask me more general questions about my experience as a developer, um, time management, productivity. I'm still happy to talk about software architecture and things like that and give my opinions on it. It's just, I don't have Android Studio even open. I'm not gonna be talking about uh, direct code samples and stuff like that. So other than that, you know, uh, if I don't get a whole lot of questions, I'll probably answer just about anything, but uh, we'll see. Hopefully I don't need to get that desperate. So uh, anyways, yeah, that's basically the plan for today. But uh, things are going well. My uh, room database tutorial is starting to take off. And uh, so that's kind of nice. It, it was like a nearly a two hour video. and. Um, to be honest, like I thought people were going to be sort of into learning room more than they are, but it doesn't look like it's sort of caught on quite as much as I expected, but that's totally okay. So right off the bat, we've got a great question from uh, Barack, and that name is, is that name, that question is. <laughs> All right, so Barack asks, oops. I'm like wired with coffee, so I'm probably going to be typing really poorly right now. I had trouble sleeping last night. So what's the hardest thing about learning Android development? Development. And it probably help if I switch to the code view. So Barack asks, what is the hardest thing about learning Android development? So I have to think about that for just a moment. Well, you know, to be perfectly honest, I, I have a couple of thoughts on this. So I think things have really improved on the Android platform. Um, I'll, I'll try and work my way to answer that question, but I just wanted to give you some example. Like when I started back in 2014, it was really frustrating. And the reason why is that there were a couple people doing tutorials and I won't name names and I appreciate all the free information they shared, but there were a couple people who were, they would only show you maybe 20% of the picture or they weren't especially good at explaining things as far as like third party teachers were concerned. There was a few great ones out there. Um, but the other thing that was really difficult is I personally found, and like I'm not trying to just shit on the Android team, but I personally found the Android documentation was very hit and miss. They would, they would generally do two things. So 
it seemed like they wrote the documentation assuming that you are you were already an experienced developer coming from a different platform so they would explain something to you using technical jargon and um that was really frustrating at first like it felt like um i would read some part of the android documentation and then i'd find like four technical words that i wasn't certain on and then i would like read those and then i'd find another crappy definition and uh, it was just generally a pretty frustrating experience so i couldn't really turn to the documentation for like let me just say the documentation was not like the best it wasn't the source of truth. Um, there weren't a lot of teachers, uh, certainly not ones uh, doing as much sort of, there wasn't as many resources as there are today. Obviously the platform was a lot younger and it was a very frustrating experience. I, the biggest thing is um, I didn't know how, I didn't have ways to compare my code with other people's code and that was ex extremely frustrating. Contrasting that with today, um, we've seen in, uh, I think, 2017, it almost looks like the Android team made it a mission to do a much better job with the documentation. Because, like, for example, the documentation for uh, Room Persistence Library and Android Arch Architecture Components is amazing. It's really great. Um, we also have the code labs that they're cranking out and all that kind of stuff. So I... The, what I'm trying to get at is that what was the hardest thing for me isn't so much of an issue anymore. But I'm going to try and think, you know, what is what is the hardest thing about learning Android development in general? I mean, really, that's... I can't really give much of a better explanation than that because the I think the biggest issue, the hardest thing for me to learn it was that there was such a lack of a cohesive way to build applications. Um, there was just really poor resources. Um, to, get, to make things a little bit more practical, the, the point where I sort of started to grow a lot faster as a developer is when I found a couple really good open source repositories from good developers. And then it, it went from like me having to learn from not very good documentation and not very good kind of quick cash in style tutorials to um, holy crap, like look at this amazing repository here. Oh, this thing's model, this thing's controller, this thing's view, what does that mean? And then I look into it, okay. And, and then I started to understand how you could actually divide your application into layers and all kinds of awesome stuff like that. So, um, that's basically the, was the most difficult thing for learning Android development uh, in that sense. Um, I might revisit that later because there's another side of that which I can kind of explore, but let me just see what kind of questions we've got. Uh, and we've got a bunch of people. All right, so uh, this is just a reminder. That uh, this is a non technical Q&A. So I'm not gonna be answering the technical questions today. So uh, I will be continuing to do that tomorrow. I know that's probably gonna disappoint a few people, but every 20th episode, I take some time to just answer general non-technical questions. So uh, for example, I just answered a question, what is the hardest thing about learning Android development and stuff of that nature? And if you'd like, you can of course ask the more technical questions next week. All right, so what have we got? That's an interesting topic. Uh, okay, so I think, uh, uh, again, forgive me if I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Sohil, um, and I think it might not have been you, but someone asked this question in the previous episode, or the previous live stream, I guess I can say episode and I didn't really have time to give it a good answer. So uh, I'll take, I'll spend some time on this because um, I like, I'm not exactly, let me just write the question down and I'll start babbling after that. So how, 
All right, so the question is, how do you manage your time with all the learning, working in wise ass stuff? All right, so let me just increase the uh, font a little bit here. So I get that some of the people watching this probably don't really know a whole lot about me and like I really don't want to make it out like I uh, put in 80 hours a week but to give you an idea of what my days usually look like um, I usually wake up around 7 a.m. and spend from about 8 a.m. until usually 12 12 12 30 something like that uh this last week writing writing the ebook um and then i go to my day job usually from like 1 30 ish until 9 30 something like that and then i come home and uh maybe have like an hour to cook dinner and kind of relax for a moment and then i do that over and over and over again and um oh my phone's going off but I do that over and over again, and that's basically what my entire life has been like for September. Now, I'm not looking for sympathy or anything like that. I'm just kind of giving you an idea. So there's a couple of things to consider, like how do you manage that? Because there's a couple different concerns you have to look at. So the, one of the biggest concerns, and this was quite difficult for me. Uh, so number one, um, and this is tough because there's kind of like a dichotomy here, but number one, manage your health. And here's the thing, like I'm, I'm not trying to lecture anyone. I'm not trying to say eat your greens and stuff like this. What I am giving you is what I do to not get sick or, and to have my brain work well on a regular and consistent basis for weeks and months at a time. So um, I'm not like trying to lecture you or sell you on anything. This is just what I do. So number one, I try really hard to manage my health. And for me, that means um, it used to mean a lot of exercise, but I have a couple injuries now and I don't get to exercise nearly as much as I like. But uh, the main thing is um, I watch my diet very closely. I eat low carb generally and I eat quite a bit of food. So um, one real major realization for me, and this is not for all people. Some people metabolize carbohydrates and sugars better than I do. My brother is a great example and roommate. Um, but I metabolize carbohydrates very poorly. And uh, I have noticed that, for example, if I were to eat like a pizza the night before or something sugary, I am really stupid the next day. I have like zero willpower. I'm totally ADD. I just can't focus. It's just a recipe for failure. So unfortunately, what that means is I eat a very boring diet. Um, I eat lots of uh, nutrient dense foods like lots of uh, organic eggs and stuff like that. I, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan or anything, not to disrespect those people, but I eat really healthy. I don't eat a lot of sugar. So that's the first thing. So that keeps my energy levels fairly consistent. It keeps my mood pretty consistent. And that's a big thing that I, I would say that's about 40% of uh, the battle is eating right. Now I do take I do have cheat meals. It's just instead of like eating a whole extra large pizza, because I eat a ton of food. Uh, people think I'm like skinny, but I used to be overweight and I, I eat a lot of food. But instead of having like a whole pizza, I'll have like almond butter and apples, which is just as delicious and way more healthy. Anyways, moving on. Um, so that's the first thing I manage. I watch my diet very closely. And the second thing is I try to um, manage my stress with meditation and cold showers. So basically, oops, uh, basically what I do is, um, uh, again, I'm, 
I'm not trying to sell you on anything. This is what I do. I usually, in the morning, uh, I do on average 15 minutes of just mindfulness meditation. If you want to get really specific, uh, Vipassana, I, I usually try, although I'm not great at it. I believe it's spelled Vipassana. And it's I basically just sit in one spot and I focus on my breath sensations for 15 minutes. And then my mind runs all over the place, but that's part of meditating is that it's not about stopping your mind from thinking it's about returning your mind back to the whatever is the meditation object so i meditate usually 15 minutes in the morning and then usually 8 to 12 minutes at night sometimes i'm so exhausted that i i just go straight into a cold shower at night and that's the other thing i do is i take cold showers because as much as i hate them uh, i find they really actually make me feel better once I'm out of the shower. Like if I'm in a really depressed kind of mopey state, um, I'll usually do this thing I like to call righteous penance. <laughs> and uh, I'll take like a 10 minute shower in a, a cold under, a you know, I'll take a 10 minute cold shower and it sucks when you're in there, but when you get out and if you can manage to kind of meditate while you're in there, it feels really nice. So I know I'm babbling like crazy, but that's basically the two things. So number one, how do I manage my time? I totally went off on a tangent here because you asked how I manage my time, but that's kind of related. So there's two things. I manage my health so that it is related in the sense that I manage my health so that I have more time of the day. I can sleep less and I haven't been sick with a cold or flu in like a year. So I don't really get sick, which is a nice bonus of that stuff. So reduce stress, eat your diet, eat a good diet. And as for actual time management, and then I'll shut up and move on, but for actual time management, uh, I'll, I'll use sort of an example. And there's seagulls going crazy outside my window. So in September, um, I've continued to work on uh, programming and I've been working full time and I'm approaching 15,000 uh, 15, words on my ebook. And I was only able, I'm only able to work on the ebook maybe two hours a day. And to try and write a book with only an hour or two a day, you have to kind of re reframe your approach to work. And what I mean is you're not going to get the quick success with like programming. Uh, so what I'm going to explain is let's say you either want to write a book or you're working on a big project and you need to sort of manage your time that way. Um, and this can also apply to smaller projects. But the main thing I would say is um, do set clear goals. Number one, set goals for success. But number two, when it actually comes time to work, so let's say I get up at seven, I do my cold shower and meditation thing, I eat breakfast, and then it's 8 a.m. At 8 a.m., I already know what my main item for work is. It's been easy this month because every friggin' day my main work item is working on the ebook. So I sit down with that goal in mind and uh, I get straight to that. So now the thing is on certain days you're going to wake up and you're going to your brain's not necessarily going to work as well for whatever reason even if you have a good diet sometimes you wake up and you just don't feel like it. So the goal is work on your primary item but your your uh rubric for success your uh what's that called a uh, success whatever uh your standard for success is whether you sit down and do the work or not, not so much the quality of the work. So with those two things, I am able to carve out maybe at least two hours a day with my own projects, my own wise ass stuff, and also work full time to pay the rent as well. So as you can imagine, I don't go out a lot. I do have lots of friends and I'm very blessed in that regard, 
but when I'm in work mode, I usually only hang out with one or two people a week because I just don't really have time. Um, I have heard of people who only sleep an hour or two a night often. I actually know one who's a friend of mine now, but I've never been able to do that. I need like six or eight hours, seven or eight hours of sleep, and that's been a major issue. So I know I've kind of gone all over the place, but just to summarize things, the way that I manage my time and my productivity is I eat mostly the same stuff every day. Um, I follow the same sort of uh, habits daily. Uh, and these are just habits that help me manage stress levels because I work, actually work as a cook, which is a very stressful environment. And then I... Um, don't really do a lot of fun stuff when I'm in work mode. When I take breaks, I do lots of fun stuff, but when I've got an ebook or a project to launch, every day, I don't take days off. Every day, I want at least two hours, and that's how I manage my time and get lots of stuff done. Beyond that, it's not a very calculated process, so hopefully that helps some people, and I know I went all over the place, but uh, that is how I manage my time. Anyways. What have we here? So, um, one person mentioned that they can't hear me, but my mic is making sound. So, if someone could confirm that. And, uh, okay, so, let's see here. And what's up? We got Darrell and I joining. All right, let's see here. So uh, Tina asks, uh, how can I be contacted directly or privately? Uh, the best place is honestly Facebook. Um, I, uh, I check Facebook most regularly. You can also message me through YouTube PMs, but my Facebook wise ass is the best way. Um, for uh, Azar, when you have a question, just ask it. No need to be all spammy. Um, I kind of answered. Let's see here. Oh, that's that's an interesting one. Uh, uh, sorry, Az Azar. I kind of answered your question in the previous uh, episode, uh, which was like if you want to start developing uh, for iOS, should you do React Native and or learn Swift? And to be honest, like I'm, since I don't know React Native and I'm only very, uh, I've only, I haven't written a lot of Swift code a little bit. I don't really have a good opinion on that. Honestly, um, in general, if you can, it's probably better to go with uh, the native language, but I haven't written apps in React Native, so I don't know what the capabilities of it are, so I, I can't really give you a good answer there. But uh, here's a question. Let's see here. So this question is from, where are we? Uh, again, apologies if I mispronounce your name. Uh, perhaps Kong? Uh, Kong asks, and this is a really good, uh, okay, this is, I love this question. This is great. This is something I can work with. Okay, good. People can uh, hear me. You know, some people, I, I think they listen, I don't know. I get very mixed opinions about my audio levels because some people think it's great and then some people can't hear me and whatever. So uh, this question is from... Kong, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. And the question is, how shall I convince my team to use MVP and dependency injection? So I kind of have to ask, like, I'm going to kind of assume that, like, does your team use any kind of architecture at all? Because if they don't, that's really bad. So. I guess what I'll do is I'll try and talk about the benefits of using dependency injection. Um, 
and model view presenter in general. And I think the best way I can answer this is to actually pull up the old clean architecture diagram, the wonderful low res architecture diagram, and then I can scream at Windows 10 for having a crappy UI. All right, so the, just one more time, the question, oops, the question was, how shall I convince my team to use model view presenter and dependency injection? And this is an awesome question because it's like, okay, we're, we're not so much looking at the specific implementation details, but like, what are the actual benefits to doing this? So um, about a, maybe four months ago, maybe more like six at this point, I got this idea in my head. I, I, I sort of asked the question like, what is like the ideal software architecture and API stack for Android, like what is the best way to sort of build an app, knowing that certain apps are gonna have different uh, requirements and there is no, to, to quote what uh, Don Felker uh, often says on uh, Fragmented Podcast, which you should check out. I'm not paid to say that, I just really like them. Um, there's no silver bullet architecture. There's no architecture which will work the best in every scenario. However, what I have found in general is taking kind of a clean architecture approach, and I will we'll get back to MVP and Dagger 2, this is directly related. And let me just kind of go into my current architecture. If you'd like an example of this architecture, an architecture which uses dependency injection and model v presenter you can see down below POS trainer uh, the repository um, that is my own open source application it's you can look at it and copy it and whatever just don't use the name and that is an example of an app which uses model v presenter and dagger 2 and that application was based off of this diagram that i made like four months ago or something or three i don't know i made some time ago and basically what this diagram is, is I'm using model view presenter for the front end as my front end architecture. And then of course, we've got the clean architecture thing going on with the domain layer and interactors, AKA and use cases, AKA and all that crap. And then we've got this, oops, sorry. Then we've got the service layer down here, which is like think entities, repository, that kind of crap. Then we have a dependency injection layer, um, which is the way I think of it. So what is the actual benefit of doing that? What does it give you? So here's the first thing. When it comes to dependency injection with Dagger 2, um, if look, it's kind of frustrating to configure at first. You're probably going to spend at least two weeks scratching your head as to why your project won't compile because um, you're constantly getting these errors like so-and-so uh, uh, -so dependency needs a provides annotation and all this crap and Dagger 2 is frustrating to work with. I'm just going to be upfront about you, uh, upfront about that. But what is the actual purpose of Dagger 2? The way I look at it and the way I think of the sort of ideal software architecture is something that basically from module to module and class to class, everything follows as closely as possible the single responsibility principle. Everything is super decoupled. So for example, why do I employ Dagger 2? or this dependency injection layer, as I call it. Basically, I want to create another layer of my architecture which contains the responsibility of building dependencies. So you've basically every line of code in things that are concerned with other stuff, like having your activities or your presenters and all that stuff, instead of building all the stuff necessary to set up these uh, the service layer and all that crap and having to worry about concurrency and all kinds of things like that, I totally decouple everything and I use Dagger 2 as my framework to satisfy all of those dependencies. 
So the end result of that is that my architecture um, better follows separation of concerns. Because then instead of having my presenters responsible for creating objects and interacting with the uh, view and the model, it just focuses with its proper responsibility, which is what a presenter would normally do. So I, if I'm not mistaken as well, I do think I remember reading in the Dagger 2 documentation that if you use DI, it is a little bit faster to construct the objects. Uh, it gives you the options. It, it's, it's really complicated, but the thing about Dagger 2 is if you configure it properly, you're going to start to see how it just decouples all that uh, code necessary to build new shit, and it allows you to make sub-modules, and it allows you to take all of that code, which must sit somewhere. Dagger 2 is not magic. You're taking code for creating objects, and offloading it into a different layer. Uh, so that's kind of my spiel on Dagger 2. As for Model View Presenter, um, I, I mean, I'm going to assume that you're working with a team that doesn't really have much of an architecture. Because uh, if, it, if it was a case of like they're using Model View View Model and you want to use MVP, I, it's not really so easy to say which is better, but what's really cool about Model View Presenter is that, again, I'm a huge fan of the single responsibility principle, and I found Model View Presenter to be the most unambiguous front-end architecture there is. Um, I found Model View View Model to be very ambiguous, I saw about as many implementations of it as I saw uh, developers, <laughs> pretty much. And what was frustrating me is that essentially we call this thing a, a view model, but it actually does a lot of work that you would expect of like a controller or a presenter, but I'm off on a tangent. Um, I know I said I wasn't going to look at code, but I am just going to pull up Post Trainer for a moment in the repository and just talk about why I love Model View Presenter. Let me just pull up the thing here. Okay, so this is Post Trainer. You can find the link down below. And let's have a look at the different components. So here is why I love Model View Presenter. So the way that I structure my apps, and I've said this many times before, is that I have a data layer and I have a use case layer, which is like this layer. I should really rewrite that as data layer, but a data layer and a use case layer. And then for each feature, oops, each feature of the application, um, I will give it um, its own package. So the first thing we have is alarm list, which just displays a list of the current alarms. If I had my phone, I could even show it to you. Just give me one second here. All right, so this right here, I know it's hard to see and it's all glary, is just a list of active alarms. And so that is alarm list component. See, pretty unambiguous. And then within alarm list component, I have one fragment, one presenter. Uh, this is dagger stuff, the alarm list component and the module. And I have everything that I need in one single package uh, by feature for this particular feature. So, I mean, what is the benefit of doing that? No matter what activity I'm making or how sort of complicated it is, I'm almost always building it in the same way. My presenter's responsibilities are always consistent. My f I always use fragments as my views. I use Dagger 2 to give these different, like let me pull up a presenter really quickly here. Or I got rid of it, whatever. Um, I'm trying to think, like, how can I phrase this? Like, what is the actual benefit of using Model View Presenter? It's almost like I would have to look at shitty code 
to compare it because it if you're working with a team that doesn't follow any kind of architecture it's obnoxious because things are in random places there's no consistency um if you have different people working on it it's confusing as hell and the nice thing about doing like a clean architecture with model view presenter is that you can have essentially i could for one application have one person working on this layer and one person working on the domain layer and one person working on the data layer and as long as they understand what the interface on either side requires, then they could work on this project independently from each other, as long as they agree on the interface. And when you use something like Model View Presenter, which is an, in essence what Model View Presenter is, is it's a way to decouple responsibilities and put them into different little classes, your, your code becomes more testable, it becomes more legible, it becomes more consistent, it becomes easier to change. I could go on and on really. So hopefully I've kind of answered your question. How can you convince these people? Um, those are the main benefits that I would focus on. Again, like it would almost be easiest if I could look at your team's code and kind of you know dissect it here and there assuming they're worse than me at coding but yeah hopefully that kind of answers your question that's it's a little bit of a difficult one because like how would i actually go about convincing these people you'd really have to just talk about the benefits and um hopefully i have talked about what some of those benefits are for you <laughs> okay I'm just going to take a quick moment to catch my breath and run a quick commercial break. If you've liked the show so far, please do me a favor and hit the like button down below. Oh, that's a really, that's another great question. Wow, I'm so happy to hear that. All right, so, hey, what's up, Bassam? Thank you for joining me again. Um, Joshua, I'll get to your question next, but, I've, or sorry, after the following question. Uh, um, so this is, this question is from Tina. And uh, let's see here. So this is a wonderful question. I'm just going to copy and paste in. Although she keeps calling me Ray and my name is actually Ryan, but I'm not upset by that. But uh, let's just fix that there. <laughs> okay. So, Ryan, you helped me buy into unit testing and TDD from your Recycler View tutorial. We write unit tests as an afterthought and not always. How to convince... Uh, how should she convince her team to prioritize unit testing? So uh, this is an excellent question because it's one of those things. So uh, what Tina has mentioned is called test-driven development. Let me start from the beginning. T-D-D, which stands for test-driven test development. Um, so my first exposure to test-driven development was with a uh, free online course through Ed, <clears throat> edX, E-D-X, by, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but I believe Gregor Kicksales, who's actually a professor at um, U UBC, I think. Whatever, he's a professor in Vancouver, which is actually like less than 200 kilometers away from where I live. I'm in Victoria, BC, but um, I took this course and it really showed me the, 
it showed me that testing is not something you do after the fact. It, sorry, testing is not that useful if you do it after the fact. It, it, it's just a chore almost. And a lot of times, like, if you try and apply it as an afterthought, it just, it just doesn't really work out the same way. So what is test-driven development? It, just to sort of generalize it before I get to like the more the specifics here. So test-driven development is to write your test first. Um, ah, I said I wasn't gonna do it, but let me pull up some code because it's just so hard to verbally talk about this stuff, but it, it's a wonderful question. Uh, let me pull up. I'm gonna pull up Room Demo 2017, which is the re the tutorial and repository which Tina mentioned, and again that should be just down in the description box. And I'm going to go to the where the hell is the test friggin' directory here? Did I forget to include that in the repo? That's absurd. Okay, I'll just go to POS Trainer then. I, I guess I forgot to include the test package in the repository uh, for Room Demo. Or wait, no, I'm looking at Room Demo. I want Recycler View Demo. Sorry. Hey, I'm bloody tired. I do apologize about that. Recycler View Tutorial Demo is the repository you want. It's also down there. You're going to go to... Uh, let me just bring it over here. So you're gonna go to the, uh, just go to the app, go to app, and then source, and then uh, test. And within it, you'll see this class called controller unit test. So my general approach to, to test-driven development on Android is that if I'm using model view controller or model view presenter, or I guess model view view model, the controller or the presenter of the view model is where I focus most of my tests. What do those tests actually look like? They are unit tests. So um, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about how to actually do unit tests because I have hours of footage on my channel, hours of footage showing you how to write unit tests. So you're going to have to just go look at my channel and look at test-driven development and unit testing and all kinds of stuff like that. And you will find lots of content about that. But just really quickly, to write, to apply test-driven development, let's say I have a part of my app which needs to do something. So my presenter needs to ask a data source for a list of data. Before I even write the code for that method, the implementation of the method, I write a test or several tests. And so, for example, I have a test here called on get list data successful. And what this essentially means is that when I call, this method is just from this class called controller. It's just a generalized thing, but I call a method. This is the method I'm testing. So I've given this controller a method, but I haven't actually written what it does yet at first. And then what I do is I decide um, what it's supposed to do if it's working properly or if this test is executing properly. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm calling this method and then I'm saying, okay, when the data source successfully returns a list of data, do this. And what is this? It simply means call the view and say, here's the data. In this test, where's another test? Uh, oh, I didn't actually write a huge number because, yeah. Um, I've This is some homework uh, that I left for people, but this would be a, another test that I would write. So on get list data unsuccessful. So in this case, I would instead have a fake data source return no data or just return an error. And then again, I would say, okay, in that event, verify that 
the view gets like a toast message saying there's an error. So anyways, I'm that's not that's kind of beside the point. I just wanted to introduce people into test driven development. So what I would do is I would write the test and create my success clauses and then I write the actual code and then I execute I run the tests and write the code until it passes. So that's in general what test driven development is. Now what does it do for you, which is the really important thing. So when you first start writing unit tests, it's going to seem like a chore. It's going to seem like a whole bunch of extra work uh, for stuff that generally speaking, you, you can usually write well the first time. Here's the thing, the moment your code especially in your presenters, starts to get complicated, then you are going to save so much effort by having a test suite which tests each potential um, event and tells you when your code is broken. It, so the first thing, it helps you design the methods. When it's part of your actual process, you um, you first design what a method should do in an abstract sense. What it, what sh what's it called and what is the success result? And then you write the implementation. So it's essentially something you would have to do anyway, except you're following a systematic process to figure it out. You have the tests to catch stupid little errors. So you, all those little errors that you would normally get, like let's say you're checking list.size, but it should be list.size minus one, you catch that immediately because your test fails. Stuff of that nature. So um, there's another point I was gonna make and then I just friggin' lost it. Um, sorry, just give me one minute. So anyways, yeah, so why, uh, why should, you know, how, how should you convince your people? So. It helps you write, oh, that's what it was. So let me pull up one more diagram and then I'll uh, um, finish this question off. But uh, where is it? Is this my asynchronous thing? And this is directly related. Where is it? Clean testing. Okay. So this is another, I like to my, write myself little note pages now and again, and they're somewhat useful to people. So this is just like a general summary of how I approach unit testing. But the, the important part about it is down here. So when you are, the point I was getting at earlier that I, I lost is when you start to write more complex applications that need to talk to several services at once, that's when unit testing will save your ass. And the way that you actually write these tests, you can write them in a very systematic way. And that systematic way is, I want you to imagine that we just have some kind of architecture. Let's imagine that we're looking at this architecture and it, the user like clicks a button in the view and then a message travels down to the data layer. And then something happens and then it travels back up to the view and the user is told what's going on. Hopefully that's fairly clear. Another way of representing this is again, if I turn that diagram 90 degrees where we have our, our model view presenter front end, our use cases, whatever, it doesn't matter, and then our data layer, and we're using something like Rx Java to communicate, what happens is we get a message sent from the view, it travels down to the data, the services within the data layer, and they're either going to say, I have data, I have no data, or throw an error. When you're working with a complicated uh, feature, a lot of times you will be talking to multiple services and you're going to need to know what, um, what should happen should service A fail, but service B succeeds? What should happen vice versa? You get these complex logical decisions based on what happens. And in RxJava, for example, 
Um, you're a, you either get like a... <sighs> observe, what's the friggin'? On success, on complete, on failure, I believe they're called, depending on which observable you're using. So you, you get these series of events. So I'm gonna wrap this up by saying, unit, and this is my note here, unit tests allow us to have confidence in our data streams by defining our logic gates in an efficient manner. What does that mean in like English? For each of these different events, which I look at as being logic gates essentially, different occurrences that could potentially happen, I write a test for each potential outcome in the code. The end result of that is that I have covered every event that can occur during the execution of my program. And the benefits of doing that are just enormous. I can't even describe to you. You also learn how to break problems down into smaller features or smaller little problem sets. And then they're easier to write because instead of, it just gives you a systematic process. So how should you convince your team? Um, number one, tell them that they're shitty programmers. If No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. that. That won't make people receptive. But how should you convince people to apply test-driven development? My suggestion to you is to really focus on um, build like a fairly large-scale application following either my process or some other process for test-driven development and um, do something fairly complicated. Do some simple stuff to teach people how to use it and then do some fairly complicated things. Like, uh, let me give you one quick example in POS Trainer. Uh, actually, never mind. I'm, I'm gonna end this question here because I've babbled for a long time, but hopefully that kind of explains to you like what are some of the benefits of test-driven development. It's a big subject and it requires a lots, of, lots of diagrams and stuff like that, but hopefully that's useful. All right. Um, so I, I've got a question from Beulah, I believe, and I actually don't know what an ERD diagram is. Awesome. I, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad my explanations are helping people today. I honestly, I was expecting it to be a pretty bad episode because I'm bloody tired. But uh, it's at the nice thing is when I walk in expecting things to be bad, I can only be pleasantly surprised. Uh, so let's get to one more question. Probably one more. I might do one after this, but uh, this is a question. So. I won't even really write this down. So in the previous episode, uh, as fellow in the comment section right now, Joshua, uh, asked me if I thought it would be a good idea for him to drop out of high school and to avoid going to university um, in order to study Android development. Um, my advice to him at the time was not to drop out of high school because on one hand, I totally understand where you're coming from but on the other hand, I do think, to be perfectly honest, unless you're in a position where you can afford to do uh, mobile app development full time, in which case you can really do whatever you want, to be honest, that, that would be the ideal scenario. If you actually have to work for a living, then learning to program while going to high school would be a good practice to learn how to balance your own projects while also sort of living life at the same time and doing a lot of stuff that just really isn't fun. Like in my case, I've had to work what I call shitty jobs. And I don't mean, uh, for me, a shitty job simply means any job that is not what I would rather be doing, not what I would rather be getting paid for. I've had to work shitty jobs since I moved out when I was 17 and starting whatever in 2014 i can't remember exactly how old i would have been like 20 or something i don't know 21 
Um, I have only ever worked on this Android stuff while working at least part-time, usually full-time. Um, so that's been really frustrating because it means that I've had so much time that I could have put into learning Android, but at the same time, I have to pay the bills. Anyways, let me get back to uh, what you said here. So. So essentially what Joshua is asking, uh, okay, good. I, I misread his question initially and I was kind of terrified for a second, but uh, let me just, I'll just paraphrase uh, Joshua's question here and uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. So uh, Joshua asks, if you dropped out of high school, what would <laughs> I, Recom what path would I recommend? Um, so, and Joshua lists a number of things here. So he's explored some different options, which is good. So uh, build good apps to build a portfolio or get hired. Start your own company um, freelance um, okay so I, I think we yeah we've got enough info there <clears throat> so um, my my first thing and like keep in mind at the end of the day, Joshua, it sounds like you're a pretty independent person and you're going to make your own decisions. And I do think that is ultimately a good thing. Um, I don't think you should drop out of high school, but you're going to make your own judgment there. Uh, so now, which path should you take if you did? Again, it really depends on what your scenario in life is. Um, if you have an abundant source of income, a rich family, um, you're, you would probably want to start your own company because uh, then you're going to have an abundance of time. And my goal has always been to sell my own products, make my own money, not have to work for anyone and not have to really work with anyone unless I really want to, which is pretty rare because I'm just an independent person that way. So, but I'm just going to assume that you're a fairly regular person in the sense that you're going to have to work on the side and you're going to have to follow a path somewhat similar to me. My original goal was to start a company making apps. And I started it actually with my brother as sort of, he was going to do the marketing and, and that kind of fell through pretty quickly because he got a pretty sweet job and uh, really didn't wasn't able to divide the time between his job which i here's the thing like i i don't i didn't take it personally he had a good thing going and uh that's totally fine but after about i think six months it ended up being just me myself and i working on my uh becoming an appreneur uh app entrepreneur and um I figured out really quickly that the biggest obstacle for me in order to start my own company is marketing. Because the thing is, a huge amount of it is being able to build a really good app. But the thing that I kept running into, honestly, is that a lot of the more successful applications on the Play Store which at that point was the only I, idea I had for a source of income, an, an income stream was just the Play Store. A lot of those apps were not actually very good. They were just very flashy and they were marketed very well. And I don't have a marketing budget. I just don't. I can't afford that. So what I realized for myself is that starting my own company yeah, that is still the end goal, but I'm going to need to 
to quote um, Henry Rollins, I'm going to need to be playing A, B, C, D, and E if I want to get to the point where I can actually have a platform and have the skills and have the products to support myself with a living. Because, yeah, you hear about those people, they make one app and then they make a million dollars and that's the dream. Uh, but unfortunately, that was not my experience at all. Um, the first two applications I released barely got any downloads because unfortunately for me, I happened to pick, like I, I picked a workout log. There's like 20 uh, high, you know, there's 20 good options to build a workout log and all of them have better marketing than I do and all I have is just the application. So it almost doesn't even matter how good the app is, it, that is a factor, but it almost doesn't matter how good the app is if you can't get people to buy and download it. So that is my biggest, was my biggest obstacle. So, um, the first thing is like, you mentioned, should you build good apps to build a portfolio? Yes, whatever, whatever path you take, Always try and build good code, like always try and do things better every project and build a portfolio, build your own website, like a portfolio website and do that. So that that way, if you do decide if something comes along, a job opportunity, you have that there and then you have something you can give to people. Uh, you increase your employment potential. Whether you really want to or not, maybe some opportunity will come along or you'll find some company you really like and you want to have that ability to just have some kind of credentials. So that's your biggest obstacle if you avoid school. Um, beyond that, freelancing, I haven't done a whole lot of freelancing. I hear of people that make a lot of money doing that, but I also hear that um, freelancing, a lot of it has to do with building up clients and uh, that kind of thing. I'm not sure how easy it is to like totally freelance it online. I've heard mixed reviews on that. I couldn't really tell you. Um, I don't have a lot to tell you, Joshua. Honestly, all I would really say to you is um, just understand that whatever path you take, you're going to have to work your ass off to make it work. A lot of, you'll hear, hear about the success stories, you'll hear about the 16-year-old 16 year kid who released this app and made a million dollars and all that stuff. But you have to understand that for every one kid that does that, there's thousands and thousands that tried and absolutely failed. I was one of them, except I'm still trying. <laughs> so, I don't know what else to tell you. Listen to your own instincts. I still don't think you should drop out of high school, but that's your call. And um, definitely build good apps, build a portfolio, start a GitHub account, and start putting code up onto GitHub. Certainly do that. Should you start your own company? Um, if you do, don't expect to make money right away. Expect that a new business venture won't make any money for the first two years. Um, and uh, I don't really know about freelancing. I haven't done a lot of it myself. So that's kind of my answer to you. And hopefully that was somewhat useful. Good luck. And if you get any more questions, man, come on back and I will try and help you. All right, my voice is really raggedy here. So what else have we got? I'm just gonna run one more quick commercial break before my voice dies. Um, Saroj, if he's still around, asks if I'm going to be doing Kotlin tutorials. Sorry, I'll wait till the ad finishes. Um, I will be doing Kotlin stuff soon. Uh, that's probably October-ish, November-ish. Really, all my time is wrapped up on the uh, ebook right now. So, yeah.
Awesome. Glad my uh, feedback helped you, Tina. All right, I'm just going to answer one more question here, and this is um, that's a. I'm trying to think. I I almost want to say your name is Lithuanian, but I could be totally wrong. Oh, I just accidentally opened Spotify. Um, that's an interesting name. So. Uh, I, I'm apologies if I butcher it. Amentas or bonus? That sounds Lithuanian to me because usually uh, um, Lithuanian names are like Zadrunis Zaviskis or uh, Vitatis Lalis. But anyways, those are uh, Lith uh, Lithuanian strongmen um, competitors. But anyways, whatever. Um, Amentas again. Sorry if I mispronounce that. Ask. Um, uh, he's a he's a visual person, uh, presumably he. Um, and this is kind of funny, so I'm I'm gonna give you what some people would call bad advice, what any true UI UX person would call bad advice. But um, what would I recommend for design mockups? Um, so. I'm totally a visual person as well, so I understand where you're coming from. Um, so here is what I do. This is my own process that works for me. Whenever I go to design a new uh, part of the user interface, so like a new feature, uh, just give me a minute. This could take a second here. I don't have a very good filing system. Let me see if I can find a good good example here. Probably not going to be in here. Yeah, I don't think it'll be in there. Somewhere. Or did I put them online? Just give me one moment. Oh, it looks like my stream is lagging. Um, room, no, uh, recycle, room demo? If I can find an online version of this thing, it'll look a lot better. No, nope. recycler view. Where is the diagram? Nope. Um, pictures. Useless fucking Windows 10 user interface. Sorry, I'm trying to find a, I, I draw diagrams just on paper and I'm trying to find the best example of it. I'm failing utterly, but I will find it eventually here. Okay, this'll do. So uh, here is how I design my user interface. So you have to understand that I don't consider myself an expert in UI and UX. That's not what I do. I'm an Android developer. I work alone, so I have to wear multiple hats. So when I go to design a new piece of user, user interface, I will draw one page and it'll look, well, usually one page, and it'll look something like this. I'll at some point find a camera angle, which is reasonable. Mostly I'm focusing in on that part. So what I find is that working on paper is a lot faster than working, for example, I used to do it in the actual Android Studio. Um, I used to do it in the design preview of the XML, the layout editor, and that's too slow for me. Um, so I honestly, I just start on paper. Um, I've, you know, if you're lucky enough to work in a company where you have a UI UX person, obviously that's a laughable approach, but that is how, that's all I do. I don't actually uh, draft things in, um, I don't actually draft things in a program. 
so to speak. I go from that diagram and I do fairly detailed diagrams. Oh, this is the thing I was trying to find. So this is, um, again, like this is a more detailed example. So I just draw the outline of a phone, which is based on my phone. And then for example, we've got a recycler view and I've indicated that you can swipe. Um, I've indicated what a detailed item looks like, um, some sample text, and that is what I use to base my uh, UI designs off of. And then I go from there, once I'm happy with the sketch, straight into Android Studio, and then I do the rest of the work using styles and the layout editor and stuff like that. So that's what I do, but again, that's a quick and dirty solution. And uh, I'm sure there are people out there who are laughing at me, but that's totally fine because I'm... Oh, yes, I did guess that he's Lithuanian. Awesome. Um, I, uh, yeah. Anyways, that's basically it. Uh... All right. So uh, someone mentioned, uh, I'm not making this up, someone mentioned what ebook. I'm, I'm writing an ebook if the, that was what you're referring to. I'm writing an ebook for introductory uh, Android software development. And uh, it's, I think it's going to be uh, unlike other introductory ebooks on the market because I'm going to explain everything from the J core Java. I, I won't go into detail on the core Java stuff, but I list out all the Java you need to start. Um, I explain how to build your first sort of hello world application and the basics of the different parts of Android, activities, layouts, manifest. And then I go into how to build your next project. And your second project should be something a little more challenging and it should have either a database or, or a REST adapter or something like that. And it should have a software architecture to it. And I explain how to actually build your software architecture first theoretically and then practically what to do. So I think it's going to be a decent product. Hopefully it is. And I'll have further announcements about that later on. So that's it. My voice is exhausted. Thank you so much, everyone, for the wonderful questions. It's been a real fun time today. And uh, yeah, um, in the next Sunday, I will back, be back to the regular Q&A format. So I'll be happy to answer your questions about uh, Model View Presenter this and Dagger 2 that and all the more technical stuff. But for every 10th episode, I like to take a minute to address some of the other questions that are a little more broad in scope. So thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you later.